Hello there everyone and welcome back to the studio today. So this week's episode is going to be the start of something new. So this week's episode as you're seeing here is going to be of course voiceover style and it's also going to be the start of a new portrait painting. This portrait painting is going to be done entirely from observation, entirely from nature. So I'm using a little bit of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue for a drawing color. And I'm working on a 16 by 20 inch oil primed linen. This is a fine textured double primed oil primed linen. That is double oil primed linen, excuse me. And I toned it uh, about 10 minutes earlier with a uh, solution of bone black and spike lavender. And now I'm drawing directly onto that mixture here as you're seeing there will not be a photo reference in the in anywhere anywhere here there will not be a photo reference because i want to make a point of working from nature working from observation and what i want to show you with the start of this painting is an alo prima style start i'm going to call it a freestyle type start where i'm working with a drawing color I'm working with a glass palette, a gray glass palette, a New Wave brand, New Wave uh, Posh. Uh, I, I believe it is the middle-sized uh, glass palette made by New Wave. And as you're seeing here, I'm starting very loose with simple straight lines and angles, just like what you've seen before. The difference is that while filming this, I did not have to speak. I was not speaking and painting. I wasn't managing the cameras. And, and this is being done entirely, um, you know, at my own pace, working from the live model. Um, I am working with, again, a same type of technique, the same type of technique that you've seen me do many, many paintings of in the past. But the difference is, the point that I want to get across is that working from nature, working from observation is the best way to learn how to paint, learn how to progress in your artwork, and also it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I understand that there can be some difficulties in having someone pose for you. Um, but, uh, mind you, self-portraits are always an excellent thing to do, and I, I tend to always have at least one self-portrait going on in the studio. So, uh, I have my fiance Lucy, posing for me. Again, she is to the right off camera uh, her head is tilted uh, it's turned slightly and um, it's it's a little difficult to try to you know set down the pose without some kind of outline so as you see there I have very basic outlines placed in there and again I'm mixing on the palette uh, this is not meant to be uh, a complete tutorial by any means this is a video about painting, strictly about the art of painting, not so much about a how-to. What I want is to go a little bit beyond that, and I want to bring you into the process of what it's like to create studio paintings. So this is pretty much 99% of how I actually paint. Notice that number has been getting closer and closer to how I truly paint. And this is pretty much 99%. The only reason I subtract 1% is because I have to press a button to uh, record uh, the camera and make sure my head doesn't block the footage too much. But other than that, this is very much how I paint. Now, when you're working from life, um, again, with my online students, I'll be guiding them through self-portraits. Um, but when you're working from life, I highly, highly suggest that you set a timer, uh, especially if you're working with, um, you know, a, a relative or a, you know, spouse, or a significant other, set a timer. Um, and I set it for 20 minutes at a time. So I was painting 20 minutes at a time, um, and I had a TV show playing, uh, One Piece anime playing um, on the side, so that, uh, you know, there'd be some kind of uh, noise or some, something that my fiance would be focused on while I was painting her. Now, when you're working from life, again, this is not meant to be a tutorial. This is a, I'm guiding you through and I'm inviting you into my studio, uh, studio painting practice. What I suggest you do 
right now is if you're working from a photo reference stop looking at it stop looking at the photo reference go to the nearest mirror um, and start doing a self-portrait better yet if you can have someone pose for you again that's a win-win uh, learning how to observe from life learning how to paint from life i cannot emphasize the importance of it and why i want to do more of it now with the painting when it comes to the technique uh, what you're seeing there is i did a very simple uh, umber drawing although for the color i chose to go with burnt sienna and a little bit of ultramarine blue which by the way if you are interested in what colors i'm using please check the description box of this video it'll be listed for you now the purpose of what i'm doing here is i'm laying down masses of color so that i can draw onto them the importance of masses of color cannot be overstated as well you can work any way you want but this is my preferred way to start sometimes i'll start with an underpainting other times i'll just go directly with color depending on the composition and the complexity uh, but for the most part even with a complex composition I, I like to just jump right into the painting and i'm using the gray-ish tone the uh, semi-slick uh, bone black rublev bone black uh, diluted with a little bit of spike lavender uh, to help with the skin tones i have kind of a pinkish orange color that i have in there at this point the colors were no more complex than using uh, rublev lead white number two uh, rublev lead white number two has um, of course it's a lead white and it has a little bit of walnut oil in it and i'm using a little bit of cadmium red deep old holland with terra vert uh, terra vert michael harding uh, brand and perhaps a little bit of lead tin yellow michael harding brand for the skin tones what i don't want is a generic skin tone i want to start with a naturalistic base to build the skin tones over top of now the way that i'm applying the color is very thick I'm not using any medium at all. There is some spike lavender, of course, because I used it to tone the canvas. But other than that, there is nothing else. And the intent, again, is to cover with a lot of paint and then have something that I can draw with. I do not suggest uh, working in this technique with Alkid, however. I know that I've used Alkid a lot before, but the problem is if you set down a large mass of color uh, in the background, it will start to get tacky on you probably within minutes, especially if you thin it down as much as I did. And if you work with a large mass of color right away on the face with Alkid, then it will also start to get tacky and a little bit difficult to work with. Alkids would have been perfect for an underpainting like I did last week, but if you're going to start with full color like this, then I highly suggest that you don't use alkids, that you use uh, just regular oil paints. Now there's going to be plenty of uh, questions, or there, there may be or may, there may not be questions, again, as to why I don't have the photo reference in the top left corner, why you're not seeing the palette, why am I doing voiceover, those are three big changes to this week's upload um, and that again is because i want to invite you invite you into my studio into my studio practice into um, the techniques that i use the methods that i use when i'm painting and i want you to have painting footage available that helps you out so you can play this footage while you're drawing while you're painting or if you want to you know, listen in on how one particular painter approaches painting um, for information, perfectly fine. But if you are interested in more educational content, again, I already have um, online classes for that specific purpose. This is not for that. This is for you to witness, for you to see, um, in an edited version, of course, how I go about producing paintings. And this is a two and a half hour uh, painting session in this particular day. 
Now, by the time this video has been uploaded, uh, this video is intended to be uploaded on a Saturday, uh, this painting will still be in between drying, in particular with uh, lead white number two, uh, since it has walnut oil, the painting will take a little less than a week, just about a week, to be dry enough uh, for me to continue to build on. So what I want, as you're seeing here, is to have a series of shapes, a series of values that I can continue to build. The importance of these values is very, very much going to be because I want to build more complex things onto this very simple thing. That's, that's the, the goal. The goal is, again, to cover and mind you, the next time I work on this, I could repaint the background, I could repaint the hair, but when it comes to the structures, the tangible physical structures, like the shapes that you're seeing on the face, the light, the shadow, the planes, that's going to be built upon rather than painted over. So just because you start a painting in this way, in the uh, alla prima way, meaning painting wet on wet, doesn't mean the next time you work on your painting, you're going to be painting over it, quote unquote, painting over it. Now, um, another nice thing about having a palette that is uh, neutral gray, as you see, as you saw in the beginning of this video, is that it really helps you gauge the values. Since the canvas was toned gray, the palette is gray. It's just a nice way to, you know, see your lights. Um, your lights look light. Your darks look dark. Your warm colors look warm. Your cool colors, well. The gray is slightly cool, but it helps the warm colors of the skin tone show through. As I mentioned, I used a little bit of uh, Spike Lavender. I want to touch a little bit on Spike Lavender. Spike Lavender is, um, of course, a healthier alternative to turpentine or any petroleum distillate, uh, odorless mineral spirits, um, or, or whatever. Uh, Spike Lavender is safer to breathe in the fumes aren't as uh, as intense i don't suggest opening the spike lavender and then taking a big whiff of it but you know it's it's safer to have in the air especially uh, if you don't have many windows or much ventilation another thing is that it thins out the paint really really nice without making it making the paint feel like you're eating at it um so to speak as you're seeing the brush strokes drag down the bottom of the uh, the hair, notice that they're not dripping. Notice that when I toned the surface of the uh, the linen, that it it didn't drip automatically. Uh, it didn't, you know, uh, it, it just didn't drip. It's it's a little difficult to explain, but the spike lavender allows you to thin the paint without using any extra oils. It allows you to thin it in such a way that it, it still maintains the integrity, uh, the firmness of the oil paints. And in terms of uh, shapes of color, I again cannot emphasize the importance of the materials. Uh, I am using Old Holland colors. I'm using a mixture of uh, Old Holland, Rublev, Michael Harding uh, oil paints, and uh, some Williamsburg colors as well. The Rublev colors, uh, natural pigment colors, are going to have to be purchased from their website, but I do, again, have links to all of the other oil paints that you can check out for yourself. At this point, you're seeing a whole lot of halftones being covered on the face. So you're seeing the this video has gone about 15 minutes now. The painting has probably already passed... Uh, a little bit longer than that, probably um, maybe 20 or 25 minutes or so. As I'm saying, this is um, an edited version, so you're catching a glimpse of um, the studio practice because the 
total footage itself was two hours, and I'm guiding you through this. Now, look at this plane change for the bottom of the lip. I do need to admit that um, if you work with bristle brushes, especially, uh, you know, very good quality bristle brushes, it makes the job a little bit easier. Since the filming of this video, I have purchased some more bristle brushes. So a little tip for you. I wouldn't use too many synthetics, um, synthetic brushes at this stage. At this point, um, looking at the footage, in hindsight, I realized how much I was struggling to get the paint on there. See that? Did you see that? So the paint didn't really want to, you know, it didn't want to mesh into the canvas. Now that's because my brushes were a little too soft and a little too moppy. Now there's nothing wrong with um, synthetics. Synthetics are great for blending, for soft edges, uh, but what I wanted to do at this point in the painting was to pile on the paint and to to build it, to sculpt with it. And we're catching a little glimpse of the glasses. We're putting in a mark in the center where the glasses are resting on the nose and in the bottom and in the corners. With the glasses, I actually find it easier to put them in in a simple form. And then eventually they get painted out little by little when I start to go into the forms of the face. But it's nice to have shapes in there. And to be honest, glasses can be painted with just a couple brush strokes. So glasses are not the most difficult thing to paint. So if you paint them in early on and then continue to build the planes of your face, accidentally painting over parts of the glasses is not the end of the world because it's only a single brush stroke or two. Now remember that portrait painting goes through what I refer to as the awkward stage. So the awkward stage happens because a painting of a human being can be a little difficult to look at in a very unfinished stage. So that was one of the major difficulties back when I was doing live stream, live streaming painting videos. The problem was that, you know, it's, for for the most part, it's a little difficult to look at a painting when it's, you know, in in the earliest stages like you're seeing it here. Think about it. The number of photographs that we see every day, all the advertisements, pictures, um, everything that we see, it can be pretty difficult to disassociate uh, portrait painting from, you know, a picture of a human being. Now, going back to the main topic of painting from life, I want to, again, highly, highly emphasize the importance of putting the photo reference aside and working from life. Now, I realize that it's still difficult to paint, as I mentioned before, uh, in portrait painting groups because most of them are still canceled. But, again, there's always a mirror. Self-portraits are an excellent way to learn and that's what I'm going to be teaching my students uh, very soon, as in the same day that this video was uploaded, I uploaded a lesson for my online students on how to go about beginning a painting from a mirror. And if you have any close relatives or someone that will pose for you, that is also highly recommended. That is because learning to observe from nature is really one of the best ways to learn to see as um, one of my or my, my painting superhero Nelson Shanks would say um, painting is the art of seeing learning to see is something that you have to build the more you paint the more you sculpt form and painting the more you look for form the more you learn to appreciate these this visual experience in nature and that is because these forms 
that I'm observing from the live model just don't exist in a photo reference. The photo reference is already a distortion from nature. It doesn't matter how high quality your camera is. You can have a Canon T7i like me, or you can have a um, you know a, a higher quality camera. You could have a um, you can have the most high quality you know Hollywood cameras, but in the end of the day, it's not the live model. It's going to be some type of distortion from from nature, and so that is really a limitation if one is only working from photo references. If you're only working from pictures, if you're only working from photo references, you, it's like putting a cast on your ankle and trying to run a marathon. It's just not going to work. And that is because it just is an illusion. It is a, it is a fake me out uh, when you're looking at the photo reference. Painting a model from nature teaches you how to really take in the visual experience and interpret it and create a painting. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing this start to emerge. Now, this painting at this stage that you're seeing is probably about an hour or so in to the painting. This is a head and shoulder study. So the technique that I'm using, again, is more freestyle. So it's alla prima style, but I'm trying to, you know, create a surface that I can build on. This painting at the end of this video will not be a completed portrait. There will be another sitting on this painting, another upload, hopefully. And then you will see how this painting is taken into another level. When you're painting a model that has turned, uh, and their head is turned and tilted in nature, you're going to have to remember that tilt because you're going to have to reset the pose after every break, and that's normal. That is perfectly fine. And as you're seeing layer upon layer upon layer build on this painting, it's also important to emphasize how much nicer linen is than cotton. And this is one of the most uh, scary videos for me to upload because so many things are being said. So many things are being shown. The truth is that painting on a cotton canvas is great. I've done many paintings on cotton canvas before and I've enjoyed it. Since purchasing uh, large rolls of linen, I can't see myself really working with cotton canvas anymore. Linen is just very, very absorbent. Um, it, is, it is a firm fabric that accepts the oil paint really well, especially if you're using oil-primed linen. And another suggestion, if you're going to use oil-primed linen, please do not use water-mixable oil paints because water on top of oil is not a good idea. Just keep that in mind. Go for the universal, uh, universal gessoed linens if you're going to use water-mixable oil paints. That being said, again, when it comes to materials, your setup is just as important as the materials and the technique itself. Now the palette that I'm going to use that you can't really see in the camera angles and you won't see um, throughout the entire thing because, again, it's too much to move around. The palette that's just beneath the um, camera angle is something that, it, that I, it's a working space that you're going to familiarize yourself with. Make sure that the palette space, the mixing space is large. Um, and make sure that when you mix on the palette, this is just my suggestion, but when you mix on the palette, that you take your eyes away from the model. I never liked having the palette right next to the painting. That was only ever done for video purposes. But now, this is strictly about painting. And you're seeing now the camera angle from a distance. You're going to see a bunch of changes uh, happen on the painting from the distance. This is another thing that I highly suggest when you're working from life. Notice how I'm holding the paintbrush. 
Now take a good look at where my hand is positioned on the brush, where my head is relative to the canvas. Now also notice the angle of the canvas. There are some things I want you to notice here. Now some of you may have already noticed what I'm going to mention very soon. Notice how I just painted out her eyes. And again, this is constantly, this is a push and pull. I had her eyes uh, not working with the center line of her nose. So I pushed it a little bit to the side. Now getting back to what I was mentioning. The first thing I'm going to start off with is where I was holding the brush earlier. You want to hold the brush as far back as you possibly can. Next, you want to keep yourself at about an arm's length away from your canvas. Now you saw that my arm was extended. You saw that I was using mainly my elbow to move the brush. Sometimes I'll use my fingers and my wrist, but mainly it's my elbow. And now the next thing, the canvas. It is not at a 45 degree angle. It is at a 90 degree angle. Therefore, the camera that I'm using to record this footage is at an angle across from the painting because I'm not going to have a camera in front of me and then try to paint that way. It's just not going to work. So, these are things that I want you to notice. They're very important when it comes to painting from life, uh, painting from nature. Another thing that I want to mention about painting from nature in relation to what you're seeing me do here is that the pace is different when you're working from nature. The pace is entirely different because when you're painting with a timer, you set a 20 minute timer, a 30 minute timer, or whatever um, for the model, you're aware of that time and that's part of the experience. That's part of the fun if you're going to ask me about painting from nature, about painting from life. When you're working from a photo reference, you can set a timer um, and try to mimic this experience, but it's never going to come close to this experience. Notice that it's it's very blurred. The brush strokes are very broad. Um, there's shapes upon shapes upon shapes in the painting, but it reads from a distance. It, it reads like a human being from a distance. Now, it's not very specific, but this kind of pace wouldn't have been possible for me uh, working from photo reference it just wouldn't happen and especially if this was live streamed it wouldn't happen um, you know in this painting I worked for maybe two and a half hours um, not including breaks and I accomplished probably I'd say nine hours of streaming time just because I'm able to just paint not talking not moving cameras, just painting. But the point of this all is the importance of working from the live model. Now, I know I'm going to say that a million times, but that is one thing I really want to make a point of. And now, let's explain a little bit of the colors. So I used Bone Black. Again, Bone Black is a Rublev uh, color. Bone Black, Cadmium Red, Deep Old Holland, and a little bit of Burnt Sienna and Raw Umber. Burnt Sienna and Raw Umber from Old Holland oil paints for the, um, the uh, clothing that the model is wearing. And I'm um, adding a little bit of Transparent Mummy and uh, Yellow Ochre. Uh, Blue Ridge Yellow Ochre. Both of those colors that I mentioned are Rublev colors to add a little bit more depth to the color on the forehead. There are so many different ways to mix skin tones. You can go the traditional route and use the Zorn palette or you can go with an extended palette like I'm doing, and find a bunch of different color combos. That being said, for a complete beginner, I still highly suggest the Zorn palette, but eventually I am going to suggest some colors as um, 
orange molybdate. It is an, a lead orange made by Roblev. I would highly suggest uh, using orange molybdate and cobalt blue. Those make really nice skin tones. Terra Vert and Cadmium Red also make very, very nice skin tones. Of course, when you use uh, Titanium White or Lead White. All kinds of different and complex skin tones. Now, again, there are no details, just form. No details, just form. The importance of these shapes that you're seeing now, it's, it's the uh, picture has been held like this so that you can see. The importance of these planes is to have something that you can build on. Think about it. It is a three-dimensional thing that you're observing in nature. Not to sound insensitive, but when you're painting a portrait, it's just like painting a still life. It's just the still life of a portrait, if you think about it. It's something in nature, three dimensions. There's a top plane, a side plane, a middle plane, under plane, and you're putting all these shapes and you're building with them. It's easier to go in with these broad shapes, it's easier, it's faster than it is to go in with a million little details. And it's more fun. You're going to see the painting really start to take shape now within the next, um, I believe, the next 10 minutes that we have here. And did I mention the thickness of the paint? The thickness of the paint is also something I need to take note of. I need to mention. I need to mention this. Because the thicker you paint, the more it flows, is a quote from, of course, our longtime favorite Mr. John Singer Sargent. But to put it in other words, the more paint that you mix and add on to your canvas, the richer the colors will appear. Let me tell you why. Because if you use thinner paint all the time, you're going to have a lot of the tone or the ground of the canvas showing through. Now that's great if you're going to be building through layers. Um, that's perfectly fine. But in painting in this style, Alla Prima using an Alla Prima start for a painting that you're going to work on for multiple sittings, it's actually a nice thing to have a sculptural feel to your paint quality. It's a nice thing to have thick paint layered on top of thick paint. Think about Rembrandt, um, think about Velazquez, uh, think about that heavy impasto that they have. And my biggest uh, word of advice for that would be in the quality of the paints that you use. My two favorites are definitely Rublev and Old Holland when it comes to the thickness of the paint. Now you're seeing how useful those synthetics are to soften edges. It's also easier to soften the edges when you're working with thick paint. Mind you, thick paint takes longer to dry. Just remember that. So if you look at it, uh, it's a little bit backwards from the traditional approach to oil painting, different from what you saw last week. 
as you're seeing there, uh, the change from one scene to the next, we began first with color, and then with edge, and ultimately drawing. So we worked with color, then edge, then drawing. And still the drawing isn't going to be 100%. That's going to be something that's going to be built upon. And it's a matter of taking in the visual information in front of you and relating shapes. That's all this is. You're relating shapes of color. You're relating shapes of value. And a little bit of a highlight there for the corner of the tear duct for the eye. Now the most important thing to mention at this stage in the painting is that I'm putting in smaller shapes, but I'm keeping in mind one very important thing, is that I'm going to give myself ample time to return to this painting with a much, much more keen eye into the observation of nature to produce an even more an even more accurate rendition of the model. Think about it. I don't recommend trying to go out a painting in one sitting, in one day, and create a finished portrait. It's just not a good idea. It's pretty stressful at that too. It's fun at times as a fun exercise, but always tell yourself, I'm going to work on this next week. I want to work on this a couple days later. Let me do the best that I can now so that I have a ground that I can continue to build on the next day. And that's what you're seeing. And always remember, when you're starting a portrait from a live model, there's always going to be a little bit of a, a sense of an, an uneasiness uh, when it comes to the first sitting in the painting. It's always going to be a little bit uneasy. It gets better after uh, maybe like the third or the fourth sitting when you can you know, really start to describe the form and the color at the beginning, just getting the ball rolling, so to speak, is one of the most uneasy times in any painting, in particular a portrait painting from life, especially a portrait painting of someone close to you. And even as the painting starts to tighten up, there's still openness to the edges. If you look carefully, there you go. There's a close-up. Look carefully. There are very few, if any, true sharp edges. You don't want any of that. You do not want a bunch of sharp edges in your first layer. That's one of the things that you'll notice when you're painting from life. When you're observing from nature, you'll see that there really aren't that many sharp edges all over the place. Your eye is not a DSLR. Your eye is not an iPhone 11 camera. Your eyes don't see all of those sharp edges anywhere until you really focus at something. Think about it. You don't want to have the photographic nature of you don't want to have photographic edges in a naturalistic painting. It just wouldn't work. And at this point, the painting is pretty much almost there at a spot where I can let it dry. 
Now, what was accomplished was covering the surface of the 1620 linen, uh, 1620 oil prime linen canvas with a ground of oil paint that I can build on. The portrait has been drawn in there. Drawing's not perfect. It's still open uh, to uh, more refinements later, but it is now something that I can continue to build on. A very simple uh, composition that we have here. So there will probably be at least one or two, um, maybe I should say at least one, maybe two, uh, more uploads on this portrait. There could be even more because this painting is going to be taken as far, it's going to be taken to the nth degree of specificity. When we return next time to this painting, we will continue to build in the same style. We're going to be building with large planes, large shapes, observing from nature, mixing up the colors uh, intuitively, and creating a uh, visual interpretation of the, the beauty and the magnificence of what it's like to take in the visual experience, what it's like to observe someone from life, to observe anything from nature and use the art of painting to poetically describe it. We're going to continue to build on that on the next upload. And with that being said, I wish you the very best in all of your artwork. Remember to check out my online classes on my Patreon. And again, take care, and I will see you on the next one. Thank you.